Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast where we delve deep into the earthy past of Scotland and bring stories buried by the peaks of time back to the surface. I'm Jenny, an avid earthworm. And I'm Annie, a piece of sphagnum moss happily soaking up the fresh rain water. In this episode, we're continuing our exploration of the connection between mountains and women in Scotland. It's already given me so much to think about, with the many layers of meaning for the environment in Highland communities. This series is funded by the Royal Society of Literature and we've taken inspiration from the Scottish Mountaineering Journals. So slap on your blister plasters, lace up your boots, stuff as much trail mix as you physically can into your cargo short pockets and join us as we head out across the waters to the Isle of Skye. Skye has some of the most recognisable geology in the world. Don't believe me? Just Google beautiful rock scenery and right there you'll find the old man of store standing proudly next to Yosemite Valley. But they aren't next to each other, Jenny. They're separated by a large sea. Surely Google Maps is glitching here. Yes, that's true, Annie. And if that were the case, we'd need much more trail mix for that hike and much larger pockets on our cargo shorts to accommodate it all. What's interesting about the Mountains of Skye is that they are among the youngest in Scotland at a measly 60 million years old. But let me tell you, Annie, 60 million years ago, This was the hottest spot to be in all of Scotland. Ooh, is there a new vegan cafe which only serves coffee beans they've grown and pollinated themselves to save the bees the labour of doing so? (laughs) Yes, there is, actually, and it's called Save the Beans. Save the Beans. Save the Beans. (laughs) Is that a play on the Scottish Gaelic? No, it's a play on bee and coffee beans, and saving the bees by pollinating the coffee beans by hand themselves. (laughs) I thought we were talking about (laughs) bands, like the mountain, the word for mountain. No. No. Okay. No. Anyway, let me tell you, this cafe is about to blow up, quite literally, because this area is atop a tectonic hotspot, which, if you know anything about geology, is not a great place to start a bee-friendly business. Oh, this is excellent. I know nothing about geology. Why is this bad? Well, for many reasons, but the main one is that hot spots form when hot, hot, hot molten magma rises up from deep in the earth and melts through the hard rock of the crust, eventually bursting through the surface and spewing lava and gases into the atmosphere, forming a volcano. Okay, well I can see how this would be bad for our little vegan coffee shop's business. Bad for coffee shop, yes. Great for tourism on Sky in time. <laughs> <laughs> because tourists love volcanoes? Well, they make the nice mountains which make great pictures, which make great googleable things for me to make jokes about later on. Brilliant, Jenny. <laughs> However, the mountains that we see on Sky today aren't the remains of lava pouring from a big volcano. They're actually the deeply eroded remnants of large volcanoes. All the lava that was spewed out over millions of years has, over millions more years, been eroded away. What's left are the solidified remains of the magma chambers, which sat below the volcano, feeding its torrent of molten rock. All the lava that didn't make it up to the surface eventually cooled as the source from below cooled. So, how can a volcano just turn off? Is there a tap? Well, kind of, yes, actually. And it's sort of what happened to this hot spot. You see, no volcano lasts forever. Eventually, the source of magma from deep below moves with plate tectonics, be that a hot spot or colliding continents or ocean splitting. All of these volcanoes are at the whims of gargantuan circulations of molten magma deep within our Earth. And eventually, every volcano will gradually lose its energy because of this. When this happens, the frequency of eruption slows and, over time, come to a stop. And all that magma that was sitting below the surface in the magma chamber 
patiently waiting for its moment to blow, doesn't get its chance. And instead, it just sits there and sits there and sits there. And over thousands of years, it slowly starts to cool. It eventually solidifies and creates intrusive igneous rock. So an intrusive igneous rock is one which is formed from magma, but it's formed under the Earth's surface, rather than an igneous rock which solidifies from lava on the Earth's surface. That's an extrusive igneous rock. And it's also important to note that not all of the Isle of Skye was formed this way. There's some billions of years old metamorphic rock there, as well as sandstones and extrusive igneous rocks that were more gently deposited on the land in large lava flows from fissures. But the big mountains of sky, the ones that we're talking about today, the Kulins, they were formed this way. Wait, aren't there two types of Kulins though? So which ones are you talking about? Yes, there are two types of Kulins. There are the Red Kulins and the Black Kulins. The Black Kulins are the UK's most formidable mountains. The ridge is 11 kilometres long. It has 11 Munros along it and is regarded as the peak of Scottish mountaineering. Traversing the ridge is extremely dangerous and difficult. It's rough, it's covered in boulders and is home to steep scree slopes. At time, it thins to a knife's edge, with sheer cliffs falling off on both sides. The rock is rough and dark gabbro or basalt, and it's the colour of these rocks that put the black in black culins. These mountains are threaded with sills and dikes, areas where hot molten magma has worked its way through cracks in the rock and solidified, and it's the dikes that cause most of the jagged outlines of the black culins. They weather at a different pace from the surrounding gabbro, meaning that the dikes remain protruding high into the sky while the surrounding rock is ground down. Yay for the geological dike! Yay! <laughs> and then, in stark contrast to these towering alpine peaks, and just across Glen Sliachen, are the Red Kulins. These mountains are much more rounded. Instead of gabbro, they are formed of softer granites, and their mineral composition weathers more easily, creating their rounded appearance. The granites have minerals in them which give the mountains a dark red appearance, hence their name. And despite these mountains' close proximity to each other, their different colours tell us that the mountain ranges formed from two separate magma chambers, each with different mineral compositions and different cooling speeds. And over the last 60 million years, they have been ground down and exposed and shaped by glaciers. It's a true tale of ice and fire. And bees. And it's atop one of these red kulins that our journey begins. So starting us off, we are following in the footsteps of Thomas Pennant, a Welsh naturalist who in 1772 embarked on a tour of the Scottish Highlands. On a hot July day, he sailed to Skye and climbed up Ben Nacalich. Ah yes, Ben Nacalich. One of those picturesque mountains that made such a figure from the sea. After ascending a small part, we find its sides covered with vast and loose stones, the shelter of ptarmigans. The top is flat and naked, with an artificial cairn of most enormous size. The view to the west was that of desolation itself, a savage series of mountains, discoloured, black and red, as if by the rage of fire. The clustered height of the Culins stood like a hill that catches the clouds of heaven. All right, Annie, what do you rate my Welsh accent? <laughs> um, it edged into Professor McGonagall territory at one point, <laughs> but you pulled it back. But Annie, I know what you're thinking from this piece of writing. There's not a woman in sight. Well... Welcome to nature writing of the past. But also, it's not a woman that we see in this piece. 
but rather her shadow. For if you recall, this mountain is called Ben Nakalich. So, the Kaliach is also a figure of legend, and there's a lot of stories about her. We've talked about many versions of the Kaliach on this podcast. She's often portrayed as an environmental deity who built the mountains of Scotland, or she rules over winter, and she is usually either a giant or she has some witch-like powers. What I love about the Kayak is so many of the old women in mythology are the kind of wicked old witch that lives in a gingerbread house and they're evil. But with the legends of the Kayak, she, she's above the kind of good or evil tropes because she's living in a world of giants and they've got their own issues to worry about. <laughs> and so... Her interactions are often less with people and communities and more with the landscape itself in the making of a mountain or a loch. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. And so with Ben Nakalich, it's likely that this mountain is somehow connected to the story of a woman who has some kind of supernatural powers. Ooh, interesting theory, Annie. And you may just be right because this mountain has quite the tale behind it. And like all my favourite tales, it starts with rocks. At the top of most hills and mountains in Scotland, you will find a cairn. The word cairn is derived from the Gaelic carn, which translates to heap of stones. And well, that about sums it up. Cairns can be lots of things. They mark Scottish landscapes and Scottish culture. Sometimes cairns are places of memorial, though people don't always remember why the cairn was originally built, unless, in more recent history, archaeologists have dug them up and found something interesting underneath. And then for some cairns we've got really thick history and stories, and they haven't been forgotten. There's a lovely wee folklore for the Farquharson clan, when all the men heading to battle would meet at a certain place with a stone, and they'd make a wee pile of all of their stones. After the battle, the surviving men would return and they'd take one stone from this little heap. The remaining stones would be put on their cairn Nakunya, their cairn of memory, and serve to commemorate those who had died in battle. Cairns can be places where people are entombed after passing away. There are hundreds of burial cairns dotted all over Scotland, stretching back thousands of years. They generally have entrance passageways and at least one chamber in the centre. Some have multiple chambers and were used for many burials. And when I die, Annie, I do not wish to be buried or cremated. I wish to be cairned. <laughs> Just think how important people will think I was 3,000 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't have cared less. <laughs> Devil may cairn, Jenny. <laughs> Cairns can be way markers, helping lost travellers find their way through the mist or directing people through the landscape. But most commonly nowadays... Cairns sit atop mountains and hills, signifying that the gruelling climb is over, the challenge has been completed, and at least for a little while, rest is awaiting. And if you recall from our pal Pennant's climb up Ben Nakalich, there was an artificial cairn of most enormous size atop this mountain. Now tell me, Annie, how big do you think this cairn is? Jenny, it is not about the size of the cairn, okay? You can have a perfectly little cairn and it can do the job that it needs to do. It's about the climb. <laughs> yes, you're right, but this is a really big cairn and definitely worth noting for its size. So go on, how big? <laughs> um, okay, so there's an old tradition that some folks still follow nowadays of taking a stone from the bottom of a mountain before a climb starts and carrying it all the way to the top 
to place upon the cairn. So most cairns on big climbs are about four to six feet high. So I'm guessing it's taller than me. Yes, it is, Annie. It's about eight feet high, but it's also 50 feet wide. 50 It's so big that it's visible on Google Earth and I measured it and it came out at 50 feet wide. That is an exceptionally large cairn and from descriptions of it we can see that it used to be bigger as well. Yeah, some some descriptions have it as high as 14 feet. So it is a very big pile of rocks indeed. And legend has it that this cairn is not just marking the top of the mountain but also marking the final resting place of an ancient Norwegian princess called Saucy Mary. Is that ancient ketchup or ancient mustard, Jenny? (laughs) Now, Saucy Mary was born in Norway, and as she was a princess, she probably came from a very powerful family. But, like so many other Norwegians, she travelled the rough waters of the North Sea and found herself on one of the Scottish islands. Okay, so there's very small bits of this story that could have a tiny sparkle of truth, but this... It's definitely the sauce. <laughs> but the sauciness <laughs> is certainly just an example of local humour. So the Vikings began appearing in the Hebrides in the late 8th century, and we don't have much information about the condiments that they brought on their journeys. (laughs) From the 9th century onwards, we have the major Norse kingdom of the Isles. This includes Skye and the other inner Hebrides, the outer Hebrides, the Isle of Man and the islands of the Firth of Clyde. So that's that's a big area. That's a lot of land they have control over. And that's just the southern part of North Scotland, Mm -hmm. because then you've also got Orkney and Shetland being the northern realm. Mm -hmm. So it's funny to think of Skye as being the start of the southern realm, really. (laughs) It's like like why Sutherland up north is called Sutherland, is because it was the southern part of the northern Viking area. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And yet it's at like the tip of the mainland. (laughs) But because of this Viking influence in Scotland, it's very probable that a whole host of Norse nobility did find themselves far from home and nibbled by midges in Skye. Well, they should stop covering themselves in sauce and maybe the midges won't be quite so tempted to bite them. (laughs) (laughs) Though there was Norse influence in Scotland, what Jenny's saying about the sauce is not true. (laughs) So what we can agree on here is that the name of the princess, Saucy Mary, is a local embellishment. It's all heavy, saucy, sticky folklore. Well, Annie, I personally love some sauce with my folklore. And some versions of this story say that this Norwegian princess was married to Findinus, the fourth chief of Clan MacKinnon. Together, they lived in Castle Mool, a large square tower built out of hard sky granite. The now ruined but once imposing castle overlooked an important stretch of water running between the mainland and sky, called the Kyle of Akin. Now, a trip through the Kyle of Akin saved boats from having to sail all the way around the outside of sky, risking stormy weather, unpredictable seas, and a variety of gruesome sea creatures and man-eating mermaids. And so, the hardy men of the sea, despite being hardy men of the sea, much preferred sailing through the Kyle of a kin than running into an unknown danger out in the exposed waters of the Minch. But our saucy Mary had a keen eye for a good business venture, and so she ordered a huge metal chain to be forged. She had this chain secured on either side of the Kyle, stretching over 800 metres, And I know that because I also measured that on Google Earth. (laughs) (laughs) But this huge chain blocked the passage of any ship through the Kyle. And she knew that the seafarers were willing to pay quite the price to avoid the long way round Skye. And yes, she did, Annie. For when a ship desired passage, it sailed to the shore below her castle and paid her to lower the chain. 
and while the men all rumbled and grumbled about this toll, there was a little upside to it. Oh yes, Jenny? Well, according to the highly reputable source of Wikipedia, Saucy Mary would, um, let's just say, flash her approval of the payment. And as a certain something was lifted, the chain was lowered, and the men would all cheer as they passed through the Kyle of a kin. So the sailors were cheering because safe passage had been insured by paying the correct toll. Yep. <laughs> and though the Saucy Mary folklore has a lot of retellings in the 19th and 20th century, I suspect this flashing bit seems to be a 21st century addition <laughs> by a bit of a mischievous Wikipedia user. Um, Annie, I'm now going to request to be called Saucy Jenny from now on. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's good reasons for that. A top Wikipedia tip is if something mentions the flashing of anyone's bosoms and it doesn't have a reference, then look for at least a second source. Well, that's a very unsaucy lesson, Annie, but probably a useful one in the long term. Plus, you are the one who complains about overzealous ministers stamping out all the rude folklore, so I bet this is a sailor's version that has managed to slip through the cracks of the tough Presbyterian church's filter. Or the filter of a Wikipedia user. <laughs> if anyone out there can find another source for the flashing Norwegian princess of Sky, please do email it to us, but without any pictures. Okay, well, you can email the pictures to me on my personal email. <laughs> And after many years of exacting tolls, Saucy Mary fell ill. And while on her deathbed, she instructed her attendants to carry her to the top of Ben Nakalich. Here, she would like to spend her last moments on earth. And then, once she had passed on, she asked to be buried atop the mountain. They were to position her facing northeast, looking towards her much missed homeland of Norway. She instructed her attendants to build a cairn upon her grave. Now her people loved her greatly, and so after her death they buried her with a casket of gold. And here atop Ben Nakalich, the fresh northern winds, which her people harnessed to travel from Norway to sky, pass over her grave, refreshing her spirit forevermore. With the delicate scent of tomato ketchup. <laughs> we find some other folklore about a less saucy Norwegian princess. I think this one ties into some old folk ballads that captures a couple of real moments in history and then spins them into fiction. It's a really simple story and we hear it a lot, that there is a Norwegian princess who is due to marry the King of Scotland. As her ship is travelling from Norway to Scotland, a terrible storm strikes, or a terrible plague hits the ship, or some kind of dreadful tragedy, and this poor Norwegian princess dies on the journey. Aww. And then, for this place, once Sky is reached, the Norwegian princess is buried atop Ben Nikalich in the wake of the north wind. There was actually a real Princess Margaret of Norway, although her story isn't quite as simple as that one. In 1290, she was just seven years old and travelling from Norway to Scotland. Tragically, she died just after her ship arrived in Orkney, which is much further north than Skye, and her body was returned to Norway after this. The accounts say that she died of sickness of the sea, and while the ferry over to Orkney can be brutal, motion sickness is an unlikely cause of death. So it's more likely she had food poisoning or some other deadly illness. This Margaret's grandfather was King of Scotland. However, all of the King's children had died suddenly. And so Margaret was travelling to Scotland as her grandfather had named her as heir. And she was to be inaugurated as Queen. Her dad was Eric II, King of Norway, and not only was she due to become the Queen of Scotland, 
but her father had also pledged her to marry the King of England's son. It's a lot of pressure for a seven-year-old. It is, but she never became the Queen of Scotland, nor did she marry the son of the King of England, for she died upon reaching the shores of Orkney. So we know for sure that Margaret of Norway isn't buried atop Ben Nicalich, but it's very possible that there were Norse noblewomen who had a big impact on Skye. Enough, at least, to inspire a mountaintop cairn. I find this really weird. We have all these sort of overlapping stories, and it's like history looks for opportunities to fit into different places. You have a real Norwegian princess and a legacy of Norse nobility in a place, or Sky, for example, and it all begins to intermingle in people's imaginations and sort of through time develop into a rich folk history. Plus, there are a great variety of ballads that discuss lost Norwegian princesses, so it's not surprising that a few of these have seeped down into the cracks of the collective imagination and underneath giant cairns atop mountains. In general, it's probably safest for Norwegian princesses to avoid any sea travel, ships, cruises, kayaks, and maybe just Scotland altogether. (laughs) That's some top advice for Norwegian princesses out there. I'll put it on the Wikipedia. (laughs) (laughs) The original Princess Margaret, who died in Orkney, has a very surreal little end note to her story. I mean, her life, it's a tragedy, really. She was only seven years old on her way to be wed to a stranger in a foreign land, which sounds traumatic enough. But then she gets unbearably sick on the journey and passes away very soon after they reach land. However, just over a decade later, a woman turns up in Bergen, so that's in Norway, claiming to be the dead princess. She says she's the daughter of Eric II of Norway and his Queen Margaret, who herself was the daughter of the deceased King of Scotland. So this woman turns up claiming to be a dead princess, saying that she was sold when she reached Orkney as an act of treason, and that she had been taken to Germany, where she eventually married. Now, we know this is highly unlikely, as King Eric II identified his daughter's body himself, But King Eric is deceased by the time this new Margaret comes along, so he can't chip in and say if this is actually his daughter. And because of this, not many take the story of this historic impersonator very seriously. Especially as she looks much older than the original Margaret should have been. She would have been about 18 at this point, but fake Margaret looks like double this aged. If it is true, she has had a rough old time in Germany. (laughs) Because the nobility understand that the real Margaret Maid of Norway died when she was seven years old in Orkney, and this imposter Margaret looks nothing like her and is the wrong age and all of this, they do not accept any of her claims to the throne. And so, unfortunately for fake Margaret, she was burned at the stake and her husband was beheaded. That that seems very extreme. It was just a little prank. That sounds like something I would do in ye olden days. (laughs) For a bit of fun. (laughs) It's treason, Jenny. It's treason. (laughs) I don't think it's good to Mm. kill people for impersonating the monarchy, of course. But it is treason. To be fair, if I was alive back in those days, it probably wouldn't be the plague that got me, but some form of treason. (laughs) (laughs) But it doesn't end there for false Margaret. She gained a small cult-like status as a martyr, and folks who believed her to be an authentic Norwegian princess who was cruelly cancelled and burned at the stake started leaving gifts at the place where she was executed a bishop actually had to come along and stamp out the prayer and fasting and pilgrimage and offerings left at the site of fake Margaret's execution. I actually do think if I were to live back in the day, this is what would happen to me. This is, this is my story. I feel like this is a past life coming back to me right now. <laughs> 
so if there's this fake Margaret over in Norway, do we think there's a possibility that there's also a fake Margaret buried in Ben Nakalich, an imposter beneath the stones, and she was never saucy at all? Well, I think this is one of the really fun things about Ben Nakalich. We don't really know why the hill was named or what lays under that massive cairn. But there's a beauty in the mountain inspiring so many stories of legendary women who held great power over this place and had a massive impact on this land. My absolutely favourite myth about Ben Nakalich is one of the oldest style, that there's a giant woman who lives in the mountain, a Kaliach. She has a rival giant, another Kaliach on Rasse, and they are in an eternal fight, throwing huge stones at each other in the traditional way that giants fight. And the traditional way that me and Jenny fight. <laughs> it does solve problems a lot faster than Twitter spats. <laughs> For me, it's intriguing to picture this scene. Two giant hags, Kayakin, tearing huge boulders from the hillside and hurling them across the sea at one another in strong and mighty furies. When you look at the jagged rocks of the coast and wonder why they looked as though they were dropped from a great height, ignore Jenny's geology and credit these giant Kaliachs. I actually stand 100% behind that. Like, just ignore everything I say. <laughs> <laughs> Though I've got a wee disclaimer here. I wasn't sure if this story was meant to be about the Ben Nikalich that we're discussing in this episode or the mountain of the same name a few miles away because there's a good few Ben Nikalichs. But I have a very silly reason for hoping that this story is about our Ben Nikalich. Because what I adore about this tale is it gives us a perfect solution as to why the cairn on Ben Nikalich is so large. Because it needed to be big enough to fit a giant. Or, or, it was her pile of rocks for throwing. <laughs> that was her ammo pile. She always needed it to be nice and big. Just She never knew when the, the other one was going to strike. Like when you're in a snowball fight and you start stocking up oh, yeah, a yeah. big pile. <laughs> Two hands. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I have my own little addition to this story as well. What really makes it glitter in my heart is to imagine that when the giant hag of Ben Nakalich passed away, her sister giant hag in Rasse would be mournful of her fallen enemy. Sad that she'd lost the opportunity to continue throwing stones at another giant. <laughs> in the bittersweet tragedy of her longtime rock throwing buddy combatant's death, her frenemy, <laughs> she would step over the seas from Rasse with her giant legs and giant feet and she would build a giant cairn upon Ben Nikalich as a tomb for her giant fallen rival with her giant arms. Oh, I love that as well. Let's put it on the Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> there are some bigger threads that run through all the stories we've talked about this episode. Both Saucy Mary's chain and the Kaliach stones are crossing the sea, one connecting Skye to the mainland and the other connecting Skye to Rasse, albeit in a minor mythological feud. It shows us that this mountain sitting on the Isle of Skye is never thought of in isolation, but rather it shines in stories that bind it to people of both land and sea. And all of these stories are folkloric origins and roots for the name of Ben the Kalich. Walter Scott, a very famous writer who really romanticised the Highlands, argued, Well, actually, we have heard so little of the honours paid to females in this time that the cairn on Ben the Kalich was actually more likely for a noble clan chief. 
and considering this hill is quite literally named after an old woman, we think Walter Scott might be a bit turnipy. In this case, it's so turnipy. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I read this. And he acknowledged that this is what the locals are telling him about the mountain. And then he thinks, oh no, but women weren't important back then. So it must be for a man. <laughs> But surely, Jenny, being turnipy is a great compliment, as turnips are delicious. Uh. <laughs> so we wish many turnipy blessings upon you all, dear listeners, for tuning in to our podcast. May your turnips always grow mighty, and if necessary, may you use them as projectiles across watery seas. <laughs> if you are enjoying our show, then you can help support us in many ways. It takes us hours of research and writing and recording to put this show together. But it takes only 45 seconds for you to leave us a five-star rating and review. So please, just before you flip over to your next show, why not write us a glowing review? Reviews really help small independent podcasters like us battle the corporate giants in the charts. Consider your review a stone lobbed across at the hag on the other side of the podcasting sea. <laughs> Unless, of course, a big podcasting company wants to pick us up. <laughs> you can also give us a follow and a share on social media. Or if you're feeling extra saucy, you can <laughs> sign up to our Patreon and help support us whilst also getting access to lots of wonderful little stories in our turnip patch of Scottish mythology. So a massive welcome to our newest Patreons. Ellen, Emma, and Heather. I like to think of you all as massive kayaks on different Hebridean islands, throwing rocks at each other, but not in a, an aggressive way, in a sweet kind of, hey, you're a really cool kayak on that island, have this gorgeous rock I found. Like maybe they're gemstones, Scottish gemstones that you're throwing at each other. You're like, hey, pal. I've got this really shiny one and I think it would give you some amazing energy. Please have it. <laughs> and you're throwing these rocks at one another and then people write tales that you're in some kind of feud, but actually you're besties. I love that because I didn't go into the geology of it, but lots of the volcanic mountains on Sky have pockets where lots of really cool big crystals formed. And so you can kind of crack them open and find these really awesome, awesome, big, well-formed crystals of various minerals. So these three can actually be our crystal kaliaks. They can. And that's my favourite idea of all time. <laughs> and I actually want to write a proper little legend about crystal kaliaks. It just, it makes my heart sing right now. Well, put a bookmark in that idea, Annie, because we might come back to it. Until next time, everyone, Slanjava. 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 <laughs> yes, we'd need much more trail hike for that mix. Many more pockets on our cargo shorts. <laughs> I was like, you just said we need much more trail hike for that mix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, there is actually, and it's called Save the Beans. Save the beans. Save the beans. <laughs> like, save the beans. Beans. Save the beans. <laughs> <laughs>Okay, so here's the question. Technically, Thomas Pennant was Welsh, so should I do a terrible Welsh accent and we laugh about how I've never actually met a real Welsh person? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, we've not had a terrible accent in a really long time. This is going to be funny. The top is flat and naked, with an artificial cane of most enormous size. <laughs> Thank God no one in Wales listens to this. <laughs> Brilliant. I don't think I've ever actually met someone with a really strong Welsh accent in my life so that was that was just Gavin and Stacey <laughs> <laughs>